interview before anyone else, uh, we will show you uh, an exclusive look at the Sun newspaper um, shortly before we go to... Uh, this is, sorry, it's Metro, it looks a bit. My Alexi killed... Um, Oh, it is the sun, my apologies. My Alexei killed by Novichok, and that is, of course, the latest coming from um, Novichok, uh, coming from uh, Alexei Navalny's widow. She says that the Kremlin uh, has been accused now of waiting for traces of the Novichok nerve agent to disappear from his body before they produce his body. The prominent opposition figure died in a Siberian prison uh, after what Russia claims was sudden arrhythmic death syndrome on Friday. His body has been found with signs of bruising, consistent with being held down while suffering a seizure, raising fears that he was killed on the orders of Vladimir Putin. Let's look back quickly on who Alexei Navalny actually is. Here's Talk TV's correspondent, Holly Hudson. This is the last footage of Alexei Navalny appearing via video link in court from behind bars in the Arctic Circle. President Putin's fiercest political nemesis jokes with the judge about how he's running out of money. <laughs> Just 24 hours later, according to Russian authorities, he collapsed and died in jail from what they called sudden adult death. <laughs> Navalny, once described as the man Putin fears the most, repeatedly warned that the Kremlin was out to get him. A former lawyer over the past decade, he rose to fame as Russia's most significant opposition leader. An anti-corruption campaigner, he fought against Putin's regime, first in blogs, then on the streets. Detained countless times for staging massive protests and prosecuted repeatedly on charges including corruption, embezzlement and fraud. His organisations would be banned as extremist, while he was barred from standing in the general election. Navalny would also survive several suspected and one confirmed attempts on his life, including in 2020, when he collapsed on a plane after being poisoned with the lethal nerve agent Novichok, allegedly by his underwear. After emergency treatment in Germany, Navalny returned to Moscow in 2021, knowing he would be immediately imprisoned and was serving an extended three-decade-long sentence on extremism charges when he died, all of which he denied. Shocking footage appears to show Navalny's body being smuggled out of jail overnight amid a global outcry with world leaders and his family calling for accountability, claiming he was murdered. I'm joined now by strategic forecaster and former NATO commander, Rear Admiral Dr Chris Parry. Chris, good to see you. Thanks for uh, joining us on the Independent Republic uh, of Mike Graham. I mean, to survive one Novichok attack um, would be extraordinary enough, but... Um, but Alexei Navalny seemed to be able to survive an awful lot of attempts on his life, but, but perhaps not this final one. Yeah, Mike, uh, good evening. Uh, there's something uh, really odd going on. If you, you go back to the 2018 Russian presidential election, um, which was basically on the 18th of March, on the 4th of March 2018, we had the Novichok attack on the Skripals in Salisbury. Yeah. And we've got another Russian presidential election coming up uh, between the 15th and 17th of March. And lo and behold, you know, just ahead of it, we've got another uh, dissident who's actually um, been killed this time. Uh, so there's a bit of a pattern here. Um, I'm not sure that Putin himself is behind this. I think it's people manoeuvring ahead of the presidential election, uh, either trying to do him favours so that he'll give them favours of the other side of it, or, as I believe, Putin's not actually in charge in, in the Kremlin right now. Really, that's an even interesting, uh, more interesting kind of scenario, isn't it? Because people are already talking about possible kind of retribution. David Cameron has already got up as Foreign Secretary and said that they might have to revisit more sanctions or they might have to look into what can be done. I mean, the, the truth of the matter is the West is pretty powerless here, isn't it? Well, absolutely. And, um, you know, unfortunately, what goes on in the Arctic Circle stays up there. Uh, and we've seen, you know, in China how evidence disappears after any sort of incident. It's the same with Russia. Similar mentality it goes all the way back to Lenin uh, and Trotsky in terms of the propaganda. Uh, but I think the important thing is um, it's something I, I think has been going on really since before the Prigozhin mutiny is there is a power struggle going on in the Kremlin. Uh, and I think what we're seeing is probably some of the foothills of a succession crisis. Um, and I, I suspect that uh, Navalny has not been taken out by Putin himself, but by somebody around Putin who actually has ambitions. Mm. 
And so if Putin's not in charge at the Kremlin, who is then? Well, I think there's a, a shadowy sort of clique. You'll have heard of some of these people, I think. You know, head, the, head, the head of the Defence Ministry, Shoigu, uh, possibly Gerasimov, the, the chief of the army, who we haven't seen a lot of lately. Uh, I think there's a lot of organised crime bosses up there. Uh, but more importantly, the ex-members uh, of the FSB, uh, you know, the uh, state security service, yeah. people like Patrushev and his son, who is the Minister of Agriculture. I think there's a... You know, I always say to people, <laughs> Mike, you know, if you've seen the death of Stalin, then you've seen the Godfather and put them together. Right. That's what's going on in the Kremlin right now. Uh, and that's the sort of behaviours that are going on. Right. And nobody's really going to show themselves as uh, a successor because otherwise... They're likely to fall out of a window. Well, quite. And a lot of people have often said, um, be careful what you wish for when it comes to what's going on in Ukraine. If you manage to yeah. get rid of uh, Vladimir Putin, you might get somebody actually worse. I mean, is there any idea what these other shadowy figures believe to be what they should do in Ukraine? I mean, is there anybody who would say we shouldn't be fighting there? No, I think you'll find that most Russian people, probably 70, 75 per cent, are right behind Putin. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I think I remember reading once that Alex Navalny uh, thought the Ukraine uh, should be part of Russia. So things don't change, uh, whoever's in charge. Uh, I think the whole of the Kremlin has staked its future on actually being successful in Ukraine, whatever that success is defined to be. But I must stress, I think Putin right now is a front man. Uh, I think there's a lot more going on in the Kremlin than we, we're actually seeing at the moment. Yeah. Would you expect to see more of this kind of behaviour then, more thuggery before the next election? I'm afraid the whole regime is uh, founded on thuggery. Um, so uh, <laughs> uh, you're going to see quite a lot of interesting things going on ahead of the presidential election, I suspect, people mm. manoeuvring for position. Um, with the Skripal thing, I actually thought that it was somebody who was doing um, uh, Putin a favour uh, ahead of it. it. Putin sets the, the framework for all this, even though he doesn't perhaps order it directly. Uh, and if this guy or person was doing him a favour, he was expecting a favour the other side of the election. Right. Uh, I suspect that rather backfired. But, you know, this has a feel again of somebody who is doing something for Putin or whoever's in charge, uh, just so they get the other side of the election and they're given, you know, you, they get to run the state railway or right. something. Yeah, yeah. And finally, I see he's put out an invitation or he's arranging a meeting uh, with Hamas. Uh, and he's asked the leaders of Hamas to go and uh, have a nice little get-together in Moscow uh, in the coming weeks. Mike, you know, I think we've discussed this before. You know, the free world is is facing a, uh, a coalition of four major authoritarian powers at the moment. China, Russia, Iran uh, and North Korea. They're acting in concert. They're looking out for each other's interests. They're promoting each other's uh, sort of geopolitical ambitions. Uh, and while Russia is pushing on Ukraine, uh, you've got Iran doing exactly the same in the greater Middle East uh, with Israel and Gaza and all that sort of thing. I think this year you're going to see China pushing all over the South and East China Sea. Uh, and North Korea, I think, will put pressure on South Korea. It's part of a concerted strategy, uh, which people don't seem to be seeing at the moment. Yeah. It's quite depressing, isn't it? Uh, Chris, thank you very much oh, indeed. Um, Chris Parry, uh, former commander of NATO, of course, with 